Let us pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, as we come into your place of worship this morning on your holy Sabbath day, we invite your presence to be with us. On the merits of Christ, we know that we worship a faithful God, and therefore we invite you to be with us and that our worship may be acceptable in your sight. All this we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. The scripture reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 19 to 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. I'm reading from the New International Version. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, in clean, sprinkled to cleanse, cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23. Let us hold unswearingly by the hope we profess, for, we, for he who promised is faithful. May God bless the reading of the scripture before our speaker speaks. Morning and a very happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. And I'm especially thankful for the powerful prayer of uh, Pastor Samuel Mani and his sermon last week. Um, I happen to be in the same prayer group with Pastor Samuel Money many times on the Wednesday 
evening prayer. And uh, at one time, uh, one of his prayer really um, gave me a glimpse what is confidence in judgment. He was praying one time that, if Lord, if you could, if you could not provide the relief, please come quickly, if possible tomorrow. I was listening when he prayed. I would say, what kind of man we have that he was confident even for the Lord to come even tomorrow. I was uh, given this topic uh, to speak to this morning as one of the topic in the week of prayer. Right? So, uh, so I'll continue from, from that point. Before we start, I will have a quick word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we can all be in church and worship with you. May you be with us and open our eyes that we may see, that our ears may hear as we ponder over your words. May your message carry us for the week to come. All this we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Faith in God's faithfulness, confidence in his judgment. What do you think of Judgment Day in the Bible? What comes to your mind? Is judgment a favorable and desirable event in the Bible? Is that something that you look forward to and anticipated and longing for the return of Christ? Judgment is depicted in the Bible as a desirable event because it's the day where God will judge its accuser and its evil associate and bring closure to the sin problem. And uh, this word closure actually came from uh, Pastor, Pastor Matthew Yuan. One day I was doing a Bible study with him and uh, we were asked talking about what is Judgment Day. And he used the Chinese word right? So that's translated to be closure, that God brings a closure to the sin problem in which Satan, the accuser, is being judged and his people avenge. And the sin problem that separated us from God will be resolved once and forever and we can be living in his presence again. However, there are quite a few parables in the Bible that warn its listener to be well prepared for his second coming, i.e. the judgment day. Some people describe those parables as the end time parables. You, you could think about them like um, uh, the parable of the ten virgins, or the parable of the wedding feast, in which unprepared for his second coming could be an issue although it's a desirable event. Therefore, for judgment to be a desirable event, you must have the confidence and the assurance of salvation. And as Pastor Samuel Mani also preached last week, right, we are living in the eschatological day of atonement in the end of times. All right? I quote Mrs. White wrote, The subject of the sanctuary and an investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it would be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. What time? The end of times. To occupy the position which God designs them to fill. So, it is important that we understand the work of the high priest in the sanctuary living in this last day. We are asked to stand in the Lord's, all right? In Daniel chapter 12, when the 2,300 days was up, Daniel was asked to go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. The Lord here sometimes often being interpreted as the inheritance when the final judgment for the, for the possession of the eternal kingdom. But 
Bible scholar has shown that it is not. The Lord here actually is used typical in the sanctuary service where the high priest would draw the lots or cast the lots to determine which of the two goats, one, will be the sacrifice for the day of atonement. Another will actually be released into the wilderness. So in a way, with Daniel, we are standing in our lot as in the decision time is on hand, where Daniel chapter 7 shows that the books were open, all right? And we Seventh-day Adventists believe this is the time of the pre-advent judgment in which God will reveal our case. And the good news is we have a high priest that works on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. So if we take a step back and look at the context of the Day of Atonement, all right, we know that God loves His people. And at one point in the time of history, He came and rescued the Israelites uh, from the Egyptian, and He tabernacled with them, all right? The word tabernacle here means that he actually lived among men, the holy God living among men. This, the idea conveys that since the banishment from Garden of Eden, this is the first time God actually lived among men. And, of course, God has to deal with the sin issue of the humanity that he dwell among, all right? Um, and he created the tabernacle, and there are many, of course, many objects lessons, and it's not the point of today's sermon, and the remedial system for man to live in the presence of God. And central to this remedial system was the role of the high priest and the blood for the forgiveness of sin. So particularly, on the Day of Atonement, what happened, or right, what do the Israelites do on the Day of Atonement? You can see the picture there, all right? That they stood outside their tents, facing the sanctuary with their eyes fixed on the sanctuary, okay? So what are they doing? Just looking at the sanctuary? If you look at Hebrew chapter 10, which I read off the screen, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's with the language of the Day of Atonement, the priestly ritual. What is important here is to note is that they actually, by faith, follow the high priest into the most holy place, the place that they could not go themselves, but they have a representative that will go for them, which is the high priest. So, the reason Christ is our high priest in God's house today, as we understand it in the heavenly sanctuary. And that's important, right? and that's very, very important for us, because have you sat beside or have you sat outside the principal office before waiting for him to call you in? Have you been one of those students? And you are like waiting, right? And you wish somebody could speak up for you. What has happened, right? What happened? And you waited for the principal to call you in. And we have a high priest. There are certain qualities of the high priest being um, expressed in the Bible, right? There's three interesting qualities here. The high priests have compassion on the ignorant, on them that are, that are out of the way, all right? Those that are out of the way and they are ignorant, people that actually didn't know God, all right? Didn't have the knowledge of God and the high priests have compassion on them. And for the same reason, right? He was one of us, right? He also suffered the same infirmities. And because of that reason, the high priest could help us when we are tempted. 
I want to tell a story now. Um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, read her or heard about Judge Frank Caprio. Okay? So Judge Frank Caprio is quite a celebrity judge. All right? it, the Wikipedia says that in 2020, um, there's 30 million of views on his court proceeding. So they record his court proceeding. And they put it up, I'm not sure what medium, but many people watch it. It, it hits 30 million. And what kind of cases does uh, Judge uh, Frank uh, preside over? You'll be surprised. It's not like O.J. Simpson or some big murder case and all that. It's sensation. No. He actually preside over pretty petty crimes and uh, uh, speeding tickets. That's all he does, okay? But he is such a celebrity because he resonates with his people. All right, maybe I'll just share one or two. Uh, well, one of them is that um, there was a lady that choked up a fine of $400. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem a lot in Singapore, right? But for her, it's like a lot of money, right? And her son just passed away, uh, was murdered or killed. Actually, the son was trying to intervene between the fight between two of his brother or her brothers, two of her brothers, the mother's brother. And in the process, he was killed or murdered. And the mother was totally distraught and could not put herself together. And um, she drama, ran up the fines of $400. And Judge Frank forgave the debt and let her go. And he said, because no one could want to be in the same shoes that you were in. And there are many such incidents, right? So what is, was exactly the sensation that Frank Caprio caused that he has such a viral viewing, right? You have to watch the video. It's the way he handled the discussion between him and the offender as a judge. He was kind, considerate. He doesn't come down on them like, okay, you're guilty and pay the fine and, and, and get away, right? No. You have to watch the way he dialogue with them, the way he asked them, the way he bring up the circumstances they were in, right? And in his own words, sorry, probably you couldn't read it, right? He's actually um, grew up in a very humble background. His father was a milkman and uh, sh shine shoes, and he himself actually um, had to work night school in order to support himself for law school, right? So he came from the bottom of the class and he could resonate and sympathize with the offenders. And I remember one of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, cases that he handled was um, a young drug offender. So he could put him to, to jail, right? Or he could tell him, that if you were to um, sign up with a rehabilitation program, I would not put you on the record for that, right? But you must complete the program and I don't want to see you again in this courtroom. So the young man was elated because he avoided the stigma of a criminal offense. And he went away, completed his program, and stayed clean. And that was such the story and the dialogue between the judge and the offender that make it so heartwarming to the audiences. Right? So one can imagine, and he says that in, in his writing, I could have given a very strict interpretation of the law, but Whenever there is case of doubt, I always give them the benefit of doubt. So that's he being able to relate and resonate with the people made him a very um, popular judge. So why is it so important that the Bible uh, talk about the qualities of the high priest, all right? And I would submit that it has to do with the sin problem that we face, right? You look at what Romans chapter 5 says. It says that, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all that have sinned, for all, for that all have sinned. Chapter 5, verse 12, right? It's actually... The, the, the idea that is trying to convey here, what do you think the idea is conveyed here? Right? That sin was actually a problem we inherited. 
depending on how, who you are, you may react to this message differently, right? And today, a lot of young people say, oh, why am I born into this world? You know, why, why is this my problem? Don't judge me. Leave me alone. Have you heard about such things, right? So, in a way, sin is an inherited problem, right? And you see the way it's being described too in 7, Romans 7. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For that what I will to be, I could not do. I will to do the good, but I could not. It, it describes, it's like a half, cup half full, right? You could see that we still retain the image of God in us, that we know what is good, all right? What is fair, what is lovely, what is beautiful, what is love, and what is justice. But there is something working against us that is called sin, all right? And, and this is the problem that God is trying to solve due to the fall of Adam and Eve, right? So the fall of Adam and Eve, we do not understand how, but because she yielded to Satan, we became very susceptible in the process. We become very easily yielded to this foreign power, which is Satan, that rule over this earth today. And God has this problem to solve. He has to provide a solution because sin has an initial, all right? It will continue to do so. So God has to tackle this problem. So how does God tackle this sin problem? We can continue to see it in the sanctuary message, all right? So if, if you look at the picture on the left, it's, it's actually vision, the, John's vision of Christ in the book of Revelation, that he sees that our Savior, the Son of God, was actually the Lamb of God being slain, all right? The Son of God being slain for our sin. And it is the way that God provided for us that He paid the penalty of sin, that by faith that we may have His righteousness. So the Bible will talk about it in a, in a short while. I'll show you the comparative text between Roman and the comparative text. What happened if you believe in Christ? Then, if you read further on, because of His sacrifice for us, we have a, not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows us, all right? If Judge Frank understand and resonate with the struggle of the common people, how much more is Christ? He was tempted yet without sin. Therefore, let us, therefore, come boldly into the throne of grace. Where is the throne of grace? It's in the most holy place, all right? And by faith, we can follow him there, that we may obtain mercy and grace in times of needs, okay, in times of needs, that we can come, follow Christ by faith into the most holy place. Who is in the most holy place? God himself, the almighty God himself. And that's the solution presented in the sanctuary message in the Day of Atonement for us to deal with the sin problem. Look over here, the two texts that uh, I have uh, listed up here. I have colored it in two different colors that you can see the comparison, all right? I'll read the blue one. I read the, the black one earlier. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, on the free gift upon all men unto justification. So. Something happened to all of us when Adam and Eve choose to yield to the suggestion of Satan. But the same thing that happened that we do not understand, if you believe this same righteousness by faith is awarded to us, and it's called a free gift because you don't have to work for it. No one could qualify for it, the Bible says. No one by the works of law could be justified. It must be believing, all right? And believing sometimes can be very easy and yet a very difficult problem. I'll talk about it later. Recently, someone asked me a question which I will talk about, and usually you know who they are. So the second one that you read on, right, is 
colored blue on the second part of it. Oh, I could not really read that well. That I say then, walk in the spirit, that ye shall not fulfill the last of the flesh. For the flesh lasted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. But these are contrary to one another, and ye cannot do the things ye mm, could, that you could. All right? So many, how do you read this? It's against, you have to read it carefully. Can you do or you cannot do? All right? You actually cannot do the things your flesh wants to do because the spirit is more powerful. Light is greater than darkness and grace is more abound than sin. So the message here before the throne of God is that there is something more powerful that God himself will supply the power for us to be able to live by faith in his presence again. Because if you think about sin as being separation, the removal of sin will bring us back together. Oops. Uh, okay. I'm sorry about it. I'm not uh, getting this <laughs> well. So, <clears throat> If you continue to look into the vision of John, of Christ in the sanctuary, you will notice that he said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And to me, this is an important idea is being conveyed, conveyed by this image, right? Because there was a sin problem. Whether you like it or not, we are born with sin, all right? And the only way is that you have the knowledge of God and you decide to make a decision, right? You see the problem? Because if you don't know God and you don't make a decision, you are always under the captivity or bondage of sin, under the domin dominion of Satan. And the reason why in the message here that Christ is knocking at the door it's an important message to us, or to me at least, right? That he comes and he looks for every one of us and no one could say, I don't know you, all right? No one should be surprised that he does not know God or have a chance to know God and make the decision because now there's a choice that he could make. So I want to uh, share a story, right? Recently, um, someone asked me this question. Since salva salvation or justification is by faith, does it sound fair that some people seem to have more faith than others? Some are just naturally more skeptical, all right, more skeptical, and it's difficult for them to believe. And so I thought this was a really interesting question to think about, right? And I tried to look for some of the most intellectual and probably skeptical people that became a Christian, and I found um, the faith journey of C.S. Lewis. Do you all know C.S. Lewis? I'm sure you have read about him or his book uh, one time or another, all right? So he, he's definitely a very intelligent uh, person. He graduated from Oxford with three firsts three first in the degree that he studied, first in Latin and uh, Greek literature, first in philosophy, and uh, ancient history, a uh, first in English. So he's articulate, intelligent, you know, a professor in uh, Oxford University. He's very intelligent, and you read why he become a Christian, right? So there won't be all the time in there, but I noticed something about him, right? In his early age, he, he suffered a lot of disappointment. His mother died, you know, his father left him and sent him to all boarding school. He's not a very loving father. Uh, he, was, he, he was in the trenches during World War I, so he's seen death, right? blood, and terrible things that happened during war. So he sees man as his worst, all right? or, at his, or at his best during the war time. So, um, this very interesting about his conversion is that he, has, he had many Christian friends, all right? professors or his colleagues in, the, in Oxford University, and they are Christian, it has a definite influence on him. Their outlook in life, 
the way they think about the problem in the world moderated him. And there was, and, and it's very typical of many of the 80s, right? So I'm not sure whether you could read it. Um, at the end of the intellectual pursuits of many people who have PhD in physics, right? Uh, PhD in philosophy, they find that at the end of their search, they actually have to believe in something. You be, believe in evolution. You actually believe in something. Because evolution can never be 100% proof. Who was there, right? When, 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 the, when, the, when the ape became a man, no one was there, right? And in terms of physics, quantum physics, and the black matters, no one could see it, but it's working, right? Or the world hangs on its own, the distance from the, the sun, you know, the atmosphere, the degree is tilted, the seasons, the oxygen. How could it be, right? So at the end of all the intellectual pursuits, they actually come to a realization that there was something they do not know, and there could be something better, in his own word. I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy. The most probable explanation was that I was made for another world. There must be a desire to be different, to be better, to live above the situation we are in today. Without this desire, then, the sin problem could not be solved. So God was knocking on his, on his door. And one day he said he was sitting on a bus in Oxford, all right? Lewis had the sense that he was holding something at bay, something out. He could either open the door and let it shut or stay shut or open the door meant the incalculable, something he could not calculate because if you read his biography or the, or the biography written for him, he struggled with being a Christian because he realized the immense commitment once he became a Christian. He has to be different, although Christ died for him. So last but not least, you see the conversion that he has. He was, his outlook in life changed from looking at himself, you know, into self-forgiveness, forgetness. And he was learning to love. Instead of looking at himself, he was learning to love. And that was a beautiful conversion story. So I want to tell the person that asked me that question, why am I more skeptical? Therefore, I have less faith. No. Because you have not pursued enough. You have not come enough to the depth of knowledge. If you have that kind of intellectual pursuit and rigor, you should pursue to the end. And you will find, like many atheists, the end of the road is not a satisfactory road. The philosophers of the world, the religion of the world, they do not give you that satisfaction and the beauty of the message of salvation presented in the sanctuary message. And you continue to read. I have to check my time. You have to continue to read. And you followed John's vision of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. You will find that he said, counsel of me, counsel thee to buy gold, strike and fire, that you may be truly rich. It's not the riches of this world. Interesting reason, right? And the white raiment, all right, and I self that you can see, and it's, it, it convey the message, the images convey the message that you need to see. You are not seeing enough. That's why you don't have the faith. And you... When you see enough, you will realize that you need the raiment, all right? And walking with Christ to develop the experience tried in gold that you could believe in God's faithfulness. And that's the message we have today. To end very quickly, I started with the parable of the end times, and I will end with the parable of the end time. Uh, in Matthew chapter 22, the wedding feast, the parable of the wedding feast was given by the Lord Jesus, all right? And uh, it conveyed the idea of the great union after many long thousands of years of separation. The king called for a reunion, the king of the universe, all right? The, the idea conveyed by the parable. And everyone was really happy, right? It was a long uh, separation, and they came together, and, uh, and, and everyone was invited, 
And near the end of the, or some point in time, at the, uh, during the feast, someone was found without the wedding garment. Um, and he was thrown out. Of course, he was thrown out. And what is the message here? Do you see a very tough God that goes by the, the rule of the book and was thrown out because you didn't wear? What, what was the idea conveyed by the image in the parable? What does your clothing represent you? Now that, that's, a, that's an interesting topic, right? Um, a fireman would have the helmet and then the fireproof jacket, the teacher would dress accordingly, the pastor would dress accordingly, um, and the tradesman, um, the rabbi in Jesus' time, uh, they all dress differently. They dress according to their profession, right? Who they are. So in a way, the idea conveyed in the parable of the garment is that there is a need to change over from who you were to a different person. And that comes through the garment of Christ, righteousness, right? It was not going to be by your own works because it, it, is, it is always the problem that you face. Christ's death on our cross removed the anxiety of not being safe, right? So you, you can't say that I, I want to go to heaven and that's the reason why you want to... Um, that could be one of the reasons, but that could be only the earlier reason when you were Christian. But the true reason is really to be in the presence of God again, to be with truth and righteousness. And you want of this no more. You want of a better place, a better country. And therefore, the idea here is that you need to put on the garment of Christ by faith. And that garment represents a transformation in you because you were not wearing anymore your previous garment or your own garment to come to the wedding feast. Of course, when you go for a wedding feast, you might try to wear a vest and everybody come. But in this wedding feast, it's very different, right? It has only one thing for you to respond to is to wear the garment which represents a transformation in your profession who you are from inside out, depicted and conveyed by this image, the idea that conveyed by this image. I, I would end with uh, this, text, this reading from Mrs. White writing. I always find it immensely encouraging. Right? She wrote, Ye therefore do not conclude that the upward path is hard and the path downward road the easy way. All along the road that leads to death there are pains, penalties, there are sorrows and disappointments. There are warnings not to go on, right? So, E.G. White saw that it is not that easy, all right, to go on the path of sin, the downward slope, that at every junction, at every turn, God intervenes, like he said, he knocks on your door. You remember David, all right? David, when he sinned, of all the people, it was, he, he knows the sanctuary message very well. When he sinned, did God leave him? No. He sent Nathan. And we can speak to this experience all in our own life. God sends people to speak to us. Miracles happen. Phone rings, all right? When open the Bible, certain texts appear, and all of us can testify that these are no coincidences. They are actually God knocking on the doors of our life. God's love has made it hard for the heedless and the hate strong to destroy themselves. The hate strong, the tough one, the neck, you know, they call it the tough neck or whatever, right? God has made it very difficult for you to be lost because along the way, there are warnings, disappointment to stop you from going on. Would you say amen to that? And all the way up the steep road leading to eternal life are wellsprings of joy to refresh the weary. And God encourages us <coughs> each step on the way. <coughs> and therefore, to end, <coughs> I think, I hope I've conveyed 
the message clearly on the sanctuary message that the solution the wisdom in the wisdom of God is that Christ the Son of God died for our sin that the condemnation of the law may be removed that you can freely therefore make a decision to be the person you were previously created to be the sons and daughters of God with no worries because it was for rewards or the fear of penalty that you can go forward and because of his sacrifice for you you could now fix your eyes like Daniel and all the Israelites during the day of atonement on the sanctuary awaiting for the exit of the high priest and his soon coming and he provided and he opened a new way perhaps I have skipped quite a lot of my own presentation uh, unwittingly but it's okay I guess the message I've given is there that he has opened a way for us into the veil as Pastor Samuel Money has read there is a way and Christ said no one to the Father but by me I now truly understand what it means because only through his blood a way is opened into the inner sanctum of the most holy place that you could by faith enter in now by faith while waiting for him to come again you can learn to live by faith in the presence of the holy god just like the israelite did in the wilderness so that when he comes again he knows you because you have been there with him with this i like to praise god for his faithfulness and by his faith by faith in his faithfulness May God will be willing, will be there at the wedding of the Lamb. Thank you. Dear God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We know that you are high priest in the house of God, over in the, high, in the house of God for us. You are the high priest who know our needs and you have opened a way for us that we may have access to the throne of grace in times of need lord may you de dismiss us from this sanctuary with your love that your faithfulness will be our stay in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>